23 years later, welcome Hito Stierl to ITFA again. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, <laughs> it's actually very moving. <laughs> I think we need just to count to 10 before we start, right? Um, do you remember the last screening at ITFA? Yeah, um, I do. I was really nervous. I think I got slightly drunk before the film was <laughs> screened. <laughs> And it was in this beautiful building inside Fondel Park. Yeah, that much I remember. Looking at the film today, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, today maybe this can be received better than 23 years ago, because some of the questions you raise in the film are now getting more and more asked, more and more discussed. And 23 years ago, they were, uh, uh, the denial was much stronger. So how do you feel about it? Do you feel like bringing the Lehre Mitte and its questions back in 2021 is it, how do you feel about it? How do you think about this change in the meaning of the film as a living organism itself yeah. with the society that is also changing? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I look at some of the shots and I see that some of the problems, which at that point in time were only just about to start, have now fully matured. For example, there is a shot near the end where we show a street sign saying Marx Engels Square, which is already crossed out and replaced by one which says Castle Square. <laughs> and this is now the location of the infamous Humboldt Forum, which is a fake Baroque castle rebuilt in the center of Berlin, in the site of actually the uh, former GDR parliament, which was torn down. And now there is a new ethnographic museum filled with a lot of looted colonial art in that location. So I think many of the problems have matured, right? They have become very apparent even to a mainstream public or audience. So naturally they are getting more discussed now. But at that point in time, in 98, uh, not that many people were ready to see it really from that point of view because the point of view that's being assumed in this film is really the one of the minorities which are getting, getting basically pushed out or um, excluded. And they are still... And, and that was pretty shocking at that time. But it is still happening. It, it is, is still happening, yeah. In, in the sense that uh, the multiculturalism is uh, uh, discussed a lot, but it's also still a big joke and a big sa sa something that makes ma many people sarca go sarcastic and make jokes and fun about the rights of these people and the uh, interest in this angle. And I think in documentary film, we're seeing that more and more uh, that films are becoming isolated because they advocate for these questions uh, and they end up sometimes even uh, only celebrated in festivals but they're not finding a place outside of festivals in the world because there's a big push against these ideas too yeah but it's slightly different now this push than it used to be. We have a very paradoxical situation. I mean, at least in Germany, the violence is more extreme than even 25 years ago. On the other hand, we are now having up to a quarter of the population which has a so-called migrant back background, right? And these people were born in Germany, they, have, uh, they are educated, and now they also start being represented within um, society and of course they demand equality 
naturally. So there is a huge pushback against basically this newly educated young part of the population that is not taking anymore the kind of exclusion that affected their parents and, and uh, grandparents. And I think this is creating a new sort of middle class um, push against you know, the inclusion of, 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 of this section of the population. How would you see the, the, the translation of this, of the uh, ideas, the topics, the, mm -hmm. the questioning of rights and so, social uh, uh, paradigms, translating into the artistic style? So in a way, we talk about these 25% with immigration background. Mm -hmm. We talk about the mainstream and uh, uh, the isolation or the, the whole dynamic or even conflict, one could say. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that this translates in art and in film in a similar way that there is a different or an other, artistically an other? I cannot talk about this in general. I don't think there is, I can talk about how I think this is expressed in this work, right? Because, I mean, this um, is putting the focus on an area which was at the symbolic center of so-called German reunification. But then again, putting some kind of Röntgen gaze on this area, which reveals it to have many, many, many different layers of exclusion, uh, but also of the presence of minority, you know, throughout the 19th century, throughout the Weimar Republic, and so on and so on, and to also excavate those presences and uh, claim this part of history, but also literally claim this area as being a part of German minority history. So basically, the, the claim that's being made by this film is minorities were always here and they are here now and that's a natural fact now deal with it so but i cannot you know translate this into a say immigrant style or something like that 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 would be very very simplistic i guess um, so i'll go to, to me, it's a th the same question, but in a totally different mm -hmm. uh, angle. When you made this film, we know that you studied film, that you were going towards becoming, like uh, 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 spending a career and a life in the film world. And quickly after De Lehrermitte, which I think took you years in the making uh, back then, you changed gears and you move to the world of art. I think this is the same question he told, the, the question of feeling welcome, of integration actually, or of being part versus migrating, seeking exile or uh, uh, refuge in a, different, in a different paradigm. Well, you know, I didn't do basically anything of this actively, it just happened, but it also happened that the industry at this point in time, never mind, you know, the content or the topics of that work, just thought that the style was way too complicated and too intellectual, you know, to be uh, broadcast to a mainstream audience that just didn't happen at all. So in that sense, there was no space for me in that industry from the get-go. As you know, I'm, uh, I, I think this is a very important point of uh, critique to this industry, that it was, uh, and still is in many ways, uh, incapable of being open towards different narratives and different approaches and the more com complicated or intellectual in this example. Uh, but do you think that the world of art presents more freedom in this sense? Is it not in itself also offering, uh, requesting so much more compromise in different ways? Yes and no. I mean, it is more open in relation to different styles being possible. That's for sure. But of course, then there's also different 
other interests, you know, playing into that type of world, which are monetary, um, financial, of course, they are about tax ev evasion, reputation washing, all sorts of uh, different criminal <laughs> motives are much more apparent, I think, than in the film industry. So, yes, there is, a, there is more openness in terms of, you know, the bandwidth of things that are possible, but then there's also more restrictions. We've been living for a couple of years now in one, what some call the, the golden age of documentary film. And in this golden age, we can celebrate the documentary film is being more seen, more acknowledged, more films are visible in the street or on Netflix or in the cinema. Mm. Uh, bigger budgets in some cases, but then also a big wave of opposition. Uh, many, many filmmakers around the world are getting much less money than before to make their films and creating their own uh, 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 defections or uh, their own proposals that are outside of this new mainstream. So here I think is a big question also because I know how you still love documentary film and that it is still part of your experience also as a professor of art that you still examine documentary film. What does it look like from your side now, documentary film? Do you feel that the golden age. Yeah, unfortunately, I missed most of the golden age, I'm, I have to say, but, uh, and also I can't really speak to the industry. It seems to me as if there's, the, there's a lot more variation and a lot more interesting uh, projects being made, mostly out of the pockets of the filmmakers, really. Um, and that there is a whole population of documentary filmmakers who somehow managed to produce work and innovate the documentary form basically on their own risk, at their own risk. That, that's what it seems like to me. But on the other hand, also, this uh, moniker of the golden age brings up a lot of different associations for me, right? When I hear the word golden age, I always think about the Dutch still life where all those colonial trophies and possessions are neatly aligned next to one another in some kind of beautiful Vermeer light situation. Um, but then also I think of the age of the tulip mania, you know, where, uh, where tulips have taken the place that is now afforded to NFTs or crypto art. So there's all sorts of crazy unbalances, including, of course, the climate changes, which are also addressed in the uh, golden age of Dutch painting, you know, the little ice age and so on. So basically all these sorts of imbalances, uh, colonial inequality, economic instability, climate change, all of that are conjured up for me once I hear the word golden age and I think that, you know, altogether it's a kind of very scary Scary scene. <laughs> if, 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 let me just go back from here mm -hmm. to your own style because uh, I had the, the opportunity of reading some of your essays and your most recent book and uh, uh, seeing a lot of your video work, recent video work, and then I watched De Lere Mitte. And when I watched De Lere Mitte, um, I, I was smiling all the time because I was feeling, wow, everything that matured and developed after your first film was already there as a starting point. So you can, one can see a lot of the way that you bring together the two worlds of uh, heavy, serious intellectual research with a much more spontaneity or uh, uh, impulsive imagination at the same time and that this, this intellectualism in a way is not preventing you from being uh, uh, also spontaneous with your imagination, with your sarcasm, with your, you know, this a balance here that continues throughout your life in, 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 in art. Um, 
do you still feel like this? Do you, do you recognize yourself today in this film? How do you see these lines develop? Yes, yes. I still get these crazy crushes on music, like for example this Mendelssohn Quartet, which I think now I should maybe have used a little less of it, but I was so in love with it. So I think I still have the same today. Yeah. What do you think your documentary beginning left or uh, um, how, how did it impact your work that is so much more multidisciplinary later? You know, I think the documentary, or in, in this case, it's a historical research, right? Which was pretty extensive because many of the sources were quite hard to access and also marginal and so on. A historical research that needs to be translated in some kind of aesthetic rhetorics. And I think that always remained, right? There's always some part of research in later years more like a technological laboratory maybe, you know, where we really mess around with artificial intelligence or other things which are supposed to be serious. Um, and we try to find some kind of aesthetic rhetorics for it or a way to access them without being, you know, uh, stuffy or also stuck in the conventions of academic research which also exist. So how can you deal with fact, or even to use a more ambitious word, moments of truth, right? While still being able to put an aesthetics to it, how can you not betray those moments of truth? Um, that's always an ongoing question, but there needs to be some layer of real contestation with something for that to happen. Parallel to this examination that you're describing now, I think one of the main topics of your career has always been your strong critique of money and the relationship between money and art. You kind of uh, encouraged so many in the world of art to uh, be critical. You, know, uh, you made an enemy of Deutsche Bank, it seems. You were always very heavily critical of the way corporate money was involved in the art world. I would be very, uh, I, I hope that you can tell us a bit about the way you see this point, because we also know that there's a certain necess necessary level of pragmatism in, in the world. But then what is very special is that you managed to be very critical of the money and at the same time to be an accomplished artist who is visible, whose work is acknowledged, recognized. Most young people, I think, in the world today working in art think or believe or are made to believe that if you are so harshly critical in a similar way, you will be marginalized, you will be ousted, you will be on the margin. How, how do you, what do you make of this experience of raising your voice and still managing to be there? Well, you know, in, to, to a little extent, it's also true. I mean, I'm pretty old now, right? And my public visibility did not come until into my mid 40s. I cannot really put it to something directly. But I mean, I was marginalized in any case. So, you know, there wasn't much to lose <laughs> in that sense. So, but also, I, interestingly enough, I think this criticism of money in the art world was actually a byproduct of film theory. It may seem quite absurd, but it makes a lot of sense if you consider that in the so-called apparatus theory of the 70s, people that made films were, or watched films were encouraged to consider the whole you know, machine of production around them. So a film is not only just the thing that's on the screen, but it is the, the gear, the machinery, the raw materials, uh, the conditions of labor, the, uh, you know, 
differences, inequalities in power between people making the films, watching the films, and so on and so on. All of that had to go into the analysis of the film. And then when you start, or when I started working in the art world, it was kind of the same, you know? I mean, how is all of this happening? What's the apparatus of the art world? What is the machinery? What is the gear? Where does the liquidity come from, right? How is this gaze and this whole aesthetic paradigm, how is it lubricated by basically uh, money which is uh, stashed in some free ports or something? I mean, all of that became interesting, but it became interesting precisely because of that filmic thinking that uh, still was in my head. And then it's true, I think for a while it wasn't overly popular, the things that I was saying. But on the other hand, I'm not, I was far from the only one, and there was such a groundswell you know, of criticism in the art world that um, actually many things could be achieved even during the last years. So the criticism became quite not only vocal, but in some ways even efficient <laughs> and successful. As the, the film uh, business is becoming so much more consolidated, the map is changing, public broadcasting, at least in Europe, is changing a bit, and all of these streaming services like Netflix and so on are really changing the map in many ways. Mm -hmm. We hear so many more filmmakers, especially in the poor part of film, which is documentary, uh, examining the experience of art with cryptocurrency, with NFT most recently, and how artists are trying to protect their independence through such, you know, content, new technologies as an answer. Mm -hmm. I know that, <clears throat> uh, of course, I mean, NFT now is has, has a, a, a visible uh, face advocating for it, being Paris Hilton, but uh, I think also that for a second it seemed like NFT could have been something that Hito Stern might be advocating for. Yeah, yeah. But it ended up not Hito Stern, but actually Paris Hilton. <laughs> how, do, how do we see this paradox? I mean, I, I think this thing is moving very fast, right? It has only been in the public eye since March, really. And we are in November now, so it's very early to make any sort of final judgments upon this whole um, phenomena. But I think we can see many things already, and it's true. I mean, um, of course, I'm always interested in new things that happen in technology, and it would have been possible that I could have advocated it. But as things went, I think the major surge in March was due to a perfect storm of several factors coming together. One major crypto boom, a lot of liquidity uh, in people's wallets. Two, pandemia, people sat at home in front of screens. And three, poor artists. I think that's probably, I mean, that's a very common fact, but it's also one of the most important. And unfortunately, very quickly, it turned out that this boom was far from being really decentralized, right? I mean, that's the rhetoric around it, that uh, access barriers are being eradicated and everyone has a shot at, you know, accessing the market and so on and so on. And I don't think that this has really played out, at least until now. Until now, it has been a top-down sort of innovation kind of thing where big auction houses and other big players like blue chip galleries very quickly fast prototype these new infrastructures. Also, to some degree, to establish the idea of cryptocurrency as a whole, right? So it was more a gimmick that was uh, basically thrown into a market to create the market as such. I'm not excluding that, you know, there will be, I'm sure there will be interesting ramifications and people will use this thing to interesting effect, if only to criticize it, I'm perfectly sure. But right now, it's more like a replica of the worst parts of the existing art world. I mean, including all the money laundry and so on. And of course, there is also some other interesting things happening. 
Well, I'm sure there are some interesting things. First, I want to uh, clarify that I, uh, I asked a very smart question now. At, at actually, I just stole it from something Kito said to me before the interview. And just to be honest, it, I, I stole the question from something you said. I didn't say it. Um, to talk about technology, I go back to your famous essay on quality in image, which uh, I know is now old news, maybe to you, it's old work. But to me, what comes now is this one point in that article that stuck with me so deeply. It is when you describe the new obsession with a high quality image as being masculine. And to me, when we talk now about the questions of contemporary art slash film, and including cryptocurrency or NFT or so on, I return to that question of where is the patriarchy involved here? <laughs> because back then, you believed that comparing low resolution imagery with high resolution imagery was also a gendered question. Is it still gender technology in this sense, in your view? Well, yeah, to some degree, I think definitely it is. I know exactly where this was coming from during my whole um, film school time. There was a competition in the length of the camera crane. How long a camera crane could you afford? <laughs> that was basically <laughs> like five meters, oh, 10 meters, oh my God. You know, that was really, really something. So this is where I, I got it from. And I think, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> um, similar things are going on within image production technology also right now. Um, maybe not with this very, very clear metaphorical package, but uh, especially for people, artists working with AI. Um, in, in fact, it's easier to do it if you have a lot of money and computational power, and there's a lot of big companies investing into you know, artistic output ma being made with their products on their platforms and so on and so on. So basically, in a way, this kind of competition for superior technical <laughs> means is still ongoing also on this level. Speaking of AI, you worked with AI. Yeah, um, we, it's neural networks, right? It's a GANs, I mean, it's a subsection AI. I'm not sure whether it exists at all, you know. But at least in, in the, on the level of meaning, philosophically speaking, mm -hmm. um, you've been studying um, New, new media a mm. lot, you've been uh, speaking or analyzing or trying to read, if that's the word, uh, uh, social media a lot. Mm. You have zero presence on social media yourself. Mm. Uh, but when I read what you, uh, uh, your work on the subject, I feel, I don't make, I don't know what to make of it because I find it always very interesting in, the, in how critical it is of this phenomena. But then I also get a certain sense that you are excited about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit, how do you see image in this new age with all of this uh, um, technology, with the, the new internet life of social uh, networks and so on? And then I'm going back to uh, neural, <laughs> neural networks, but mm -hmm. he, he, here I think starts the question. You're very critical. Are you against? Is there something here that one can uh, uh, sp put a finger on? The questioning seems to be very open-ended. Yeah, I want to make this really more general, right? Because I, I don't care about the next platform and the next TikTok. It, it's, it's a bit of a old news by now. But I think I'm still really troubled yet fascinated by the fact that the question I started with in documentary 25 years or more ago, which is basically about the commodification of truth 
uh, and the submission of fact to popularity, which is, I think, one of the core issues that people still deal with in the industry. How popular is my fact-based product? Something like that. That this has become one of the key questions which is undermining and destroying societies worldwide to an unprecedented degree, right? We are having riots not only in you know, southern countries uh, incited by social media, but in the uh, western metropolis happening. So in that sense, this real basic question what is truth as a commodity or fact as a commodity has managed to insert itself into people's life to a very, very dramatic extent, basically destroying um, the societies they live in to some degree. And that's only one aspect. One could go into the climate aspect, you know, of the whole internet, uh, but also internet communication, and so on and so on. So there's many, many layers which are super existential today. And it's like with, you know, the, the, the still from uh, Lehre Mitte, which has blossomed into a full-grown problem, so also has this question of truth, and what happens with truth when it is subjected to the market? So has this blossomed into a real global problem? You know, I, I, uh, th there's always a, a little issue. Uh, I or some someone like me, so to speak, who comes from a, a, a fakely a fake project of a socialist. A state like my home country of Syria, mm -hmm. where uh, a lot of words lose meaning, you know, uh, are totally emptied, and it doesn't matter if I believe in justice, social justice, and so on or not, I'm also so scared of someone saying the truth. The whole term, the truth, is to me, uh, becomes sometimes an oppressive concept. And then it becomes between the market or the truth, in the context of, of the, the contemporary co European context, it feels like the truth is an antidote to uh, neoliberalism, in a way, that to this commodification that you are describing. But if we go to the truth itself, then it is also prone to becoming uh, uh, an oppression tool or an instrument of opp oppression, because somebody owns it. If it's an object, if it's absolute, then somebody can actually own it um, how do you see that? Because I think there's always this two parts of the world, it seems sometimes, like the yeah, two yeah. sides of this equation. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. Uh, it always makes me think about uh, looking at the New York Times, having this advertisement saying, the truth, 50% off. <laughs> And you know, I mean, New York Times really, really has a good fact-checking department. I know that they have great standards, but 50% off? No, you're joking. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. There, there is sometimes a sort of liberal glorification of what the, they suppose the truth is. I think, you know, that the truth is a matter of, um, of debate. But the aliveness of the debate determines the quality of the truth. And by debate, I do not mean yelling or, I don't know, mo mobs on the internet. Now, I, I'll just ask you a question that I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. What's your problem with, with memes? I Why do you have a problem with memes, Hito? But I don't have a problem with memes. You're always criticizing memes. I love memes. <laughs> Many people, we love memes. Why are... I don't have a problem with memes, honestly. My daughter shows them to me all the time. <laughs> you worked a lot on image from image in film in the more like now conventional sense of the word. Uh, you wrote about image quality and a new era of image going on the internet before the uh, big wave of citizen journalism on YouTube, for example. So when you wrote and worked on this, 
the Arab Spring did not start yet, which was the biggest, I think, explosion of low resolution imagery that is all about the question of the truth. And uh, that, I think that's the best possible praise to a thinker that you wrote that, that you did this examination or this questioning before it became an absolutely uh, visible phenomenon. But then it became visible. You continued your work differently and where you got to the critique of what's happening to the image on the internet and the value of image uh, until you worked also or commented on the phenomena like memes and so on. Can you tell us about this? Where do you see image today in this big space of the internet? Good question. <laughs> yeah, a long one. I, I yeah. prepared it for months. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bit vast. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Let's take a break by talking about the films you picked for yeah. Itfa. Because I think this is another way of looking at the same questions, mm -hmm. but from a different, more, more yeah, direct no, no, sense. I was thinking about it, you know, because when you said uh, that I wrote about the images that surfaced during the Arab Spring before these even existed, of course, the things I had in mind were the images um, unearthed by Farocchi and Uitza, right, for their videograms of the revolution, which were also mainly or oh, to some degree amateur camcorder recordings. So basically these things already existed in the beginning of the 90s, these kinds of recordings, and they were already very potent types of media. So, um, yeah, and then the platform changed. Arab Spring was more mediated by Facebook and YouTube, I guess. I mean, not, not by other... Uh, means of distribution. But all these things had been um, developing for quite a while since the, since the development of camcorders, I would say, and probably even earlier than that. V Videograms of a Revolution by Harun Farouki and Andri Ojika is one of the 14 films you mm -hmm. selected as your top 10. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's first, of course, it's a good, it's a good statement that uh, I told you we do at ITFA this uh, traditional set of top 10 films by our guest of honor. Mm -hmm. And you said it doesn't have to be 10. And I thought, why does it have to be 10? What's the, uh, what's the, uh, why is it a sacred number? It's, I'll still call it top 10, even if it's 14, fine. That's the section is called 10, and Hito's 10 is 14. So talk about fact, it's not 10, <laughs> it's, it's symbolically your top 10. There's videograms of a revolution, but there is also, you take us to a totally different space when you take us, for example, to the works of Barbara Hammer, to a so much more uh, uh, um, like older work in, in uh, age, but also a different take on the world that is so much more feminist and focused, gendered and questioning in a different way. That's part of who you are, isn't it? That's also this question, this feminist question that is rarely uh, on the facade of what you are doing, but often visible in the background. How do you see this in this era? Because, of course, the film world is discussing this all the time. ITFA is making sure it's minimum 50% films by women filmmakers. We're trying all the time to balance the process. And to me, of course, it's so much more about the process than the, the result. So it's about who is making the decision and not only about the final selection. How do you see this today? What is your position in this wave of new way of examining feminism in film, in art? Well, I think that's the logical step, right? Not, I mean, 
Barbara Hammer was one of the big pioneers and I was just so happy to be able to honor, you know, her fantastic and also tremendously generous presence. I mean, she was just a very generous person who influenced so many other people. But um, the point is, the feminism needs to move from being represented on the screen, which is not, um, which w was a hard fought battle in the first place anyway, to, you know, the apparatus, the machine, the um, whole um, mode of distributing, discussing, producing, financing, also criticizing films. That's where it needs to fil filter in structurally also. So I think the process is uh, necessary, unavoidable, absolutely belated, and needs to be continued, if not accelerated. I remember reading somewhere that you always considered Harun Farooqi to be a main uh, mentor or influence, not mentor, I mean at least influence on your beginning at least. Why? Can you tell us more about the significance of Farooqi's work or method? Uh, yeah, I didn't even question it. You know, when I was starting out, when to be interested in the documentary at all, uh, I think I just kept being surprised how he was producing new solutions and always excellent and sometimes even completely unexpected ones to this problem of the documentary. He was able to do it in several completely different idioms, documentary idioms, and also to write on top of it. Plus he was a super funny person, so what, what else could you wish for, you know? I can't wait to see how the audience will receive the very different iterations in, in your uh, top ten, because mm -hmm. I think there is also a, a very special film from Japan that yeah. you brought to to our attention that w that I didn't know about, that I watched after you uh, uh, selected. Anything to say about this different uh, different kind of film that you uh, uh, selected too? I saw that film, I think, two years after it was made. It must have been made around 85. Yama, it's called. And it is a documentary about um, day, day laborers in construction being exploited by the Japanese mafia, mostly from minorities and lower castes. And at that point in time, it was basically, it did not correspond to any image of Japan that anyone, including Japanese, had at that time. It was the period of the bubble economy, super flat, if you like. Um, and there was simply no mental space to um, discuss the persisting injustices in the uh, Japanese labor system. And both directors got killed by the mafia, one uh, while making the film and the other after completing it. And I remember it being such a massive, having such a massive impact when I first saw it. I mean, this was more or less two years after the film had been made. I never forgot it. And I, I know that it's very, very rarely been shown. So, and I knew that this would be a good chance, you know, to remind the world that this film had been made. No, I, I think it was amazing to discover, and it was, I, I must say that it's, it's a, a find, because it was even very difficult to get hold of the film yeah. itself. It's not a film that is going around very often. I think there's three copies. Um, the last thing I, I want to, mention is uh, or to ask you about to tell us about is citizen four and what this famous film of laura poitras that you have also included in your list that, because of course it connects directly to some of your works to your works that connect that, that study or examine the questions of surveillance mm -hmm. uh, you you made some significant examination of the way satellites can see the earth for example and then you bring us in your top 10 selection a film that 
that's this, the Edward Snowden film of Flora Poitras. How, uh, what's the significance of this point to your own worldview now? Yeah, it was a very interesting period because um, while Laura was working on this film in Berlin, basically, there were a lot of colleagues around her, including her and me and other people who were discussing these issues of surveillance, basically, from very, very different angles. But it was very apparent that there was a that there was a huge problem with digital surveillance. So basically from, and Laura well, was working on the film, which actually we didn't know about until it was published. Um, but her angle was the one that I think was the first successful political artwork of the 21st century. I, I, it had a major impact. Of course, it could have had a more major impact and it should have, but it did have quite some real world repercussions while using quite traditional documentary means. And I had already thought that this was no longer possible, but it turned out it was. I think we'll open the floor if somebody would like to join us and ask a question to Lito. It's not... There is someone. Yeah, here you are. Uh, no, the, the, the microphone is coming. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to ask you a question. Um, um, I was just wondering, uh, you were referring to patriarchy and to representing more women uh, in film, and you were saying also that we need to go further than that, that we need to um, be in, and I say we because I'm a woman, um, uh, we need to be there in apparatus, in all the other aspects of, of movie, of, of art, of photography. And I was just wondering, um, how do you how do you see that process? What do you mean exactly? How how can we women be more into the apparatus in all the other aspects um, of of art of film? Well, I mean, f first of all, I think this is not only a task that women should have to do, right? I mean, it should be a universal task. Also, it should not just extend to women, but also to all other sorts of people that have been disparaged historically or at present. Um, so I think defining this as a universal task and holding everyone accountable regardless of who they are to, to implement that kind of progress wherever they happen to be, I think that's a starting point. I think we'll take one more question before we close. If you can talk loud enough for the microphone to hear you. Uh, we can. Thank you so much for this talk. I think um, we're in so much need to listen to artists like you who speaking about the importance of uncovering where the money comes from and where we're sitting right now and what the festival means in a way as well. Right? Because those films that we're watching are also being showcased to us and the only possibility is that belong to us, which is food festivals that, uh, just like in the art world, also in cinema, are implemented by, by, by the same structures that are the ones that are oppressing us. My question to you would be, do you believe that um, alternative technology screenings, so any other way of screening films um, that, that, that we've seen so much during the pandemic, Oh, that's at least three questions rolled in one, right? <laughs> um, 
Well, I mean, I think right now everyone is just so tired by the pandemic screen watching that uh, there is a need and a necessity for people to come together to discuss films again, let alone to watch it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, yes, this usually requires some resources. And then the question is, where, where do they come from? And I have to say, I'm not any more acquainted to the festival world, so I don't really know where, uh, what the donors are. I used to think that mainly it's governments that fund these kind of um, um, occasions, but m maybe, maybe if you have other information, it would be great to let us know. No, I think this is a very big question. But it has, it is like everything else, very much connected to uh, elections. So if we look at the contemporary history of Europe, for example, and the different governments, we see clearly that the share of public money from the, the subsidizing cultural life is connected every time to the different government, to the different electoral results, and it goes up and down. Uh, uh, culture is expected to find money in the corporate world or from the market more with certain governments and then other governments are more supportive and the percentage of uh, corporate money versus taxpayer money changes over time and that is uh, that puts culture altogether uh, at the mercy of elections. So the, it's the same process of everything else, honestly. But I think it is a very valid question. It's, uh, it's an important examination that is often forgotten. Often people look at cultural activities like film festivals and forget that it is an economic body too. Uh, so I'm may very much with you on the questioning. Still, I think the question that I would that I don't want to take over from Hito is, can we imagine that technology, so for example, screening films online, would be a liberation act for film, for the film, uh, 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 for, for circulating films freely or f in a freer way without the, uh, being subjugated to the markets, uh, uh, the financing. Okay, let, again, twofold question. I think to come back to your question, in the art world, and certainly is not an example for many things, but in the last years we have seen that divesting strategies have worked and that pressure to divest from certain sponsors has worked and that institutions can also do it and demand it and then find other sponsors, it's totally possible. So if this festival happens to be funded by, I don't know, Shell or something, then it would be entirely possible to just say no to it. That's an option, that's the first thing. The second thing is internet, yes, yes and no. Uh, we can do it, of course, the many audience will benefit from it because they will get to see works which they haven't seen before. Unfortunately, Experience shows that this leads to filmmakers exploiting themselves because they have almost no revenue from uh, working, I mean from basically showing their films. They cannot monetize it usually via the internet and it's very uh, difficult for them to get paid in this way. So it's a double-edged sword. It's the same, in many ways, the same question of NFT, isn't it? Because it's in a way about cutting the uh, the many layers of mediators and commissions. Uh, yeah, this cutting the middleman thing is uh, also very double-edged sword because in the art world, it turns out the middle people usually create the market. They do not only own the market and control the market, they usually also create the market, which means that if you take them away, you take away most of the opportunities to make any money whatsoever. And that's the dilemma. Also for me as a filmmaker, of course, I can put all my stuff online and it is, you can find it online, right? But uh, in terms of making a living, the work is free, which is great, but uh, I doubt that most people would be able to make a living of 
that. And that would require very new strategies which uh, are feasible, technologically feasible, like DAO cooperatives to basically monetize uh, collective um, bodies of intellectual property or something like that. And before getting too excited about it, there's of course also a huge um, possibility that this would get recuperated by major media industries, but at least it's something that needs to be explored properly. It's certainly not a solution, an out of the box solution, certainly not. I think, uh, I think it's very good to leave at a, a very open note like this of uh, this uh, unanswerable world that uh, has so many problems but also uh, the answers might not be always just yes and no they are more nuanced than that um, Hito thank you so much I hope that we will have uh, a good time watching the films you have selected and of course, we will have your talk uh, uh, together with some of the filmmakers whose films you selected. Uh, you can look up Hito and the top 10 filmmakers, uh, a talk that will still happen over the weekend. Thank you, Hito, very much. And uh, welcome again to Litva. Thank you.